Good morning, church. Uh, so, as Debbie said, we are turning things upside down this morning. Um, I take full blame for that. <laughs> I, uh, I learned a very valuable lesson when I was a pastor uh, at my other church. And I think, actually, Mitch, it was you that taught me this. Don't ask for permission. Just seek forgiveness later. So, <laughs> thank you, Pastor John. <laughs> We have, we have literally turned it upside down. If you're visiting today, if you're new here, we've, we've really turned things upside down uh, where we normally start with worship, with, with singing and praising God, uh, and then we go into the sermon. We are flipping it over this morning, and I want to flip everything over, and I just, so that's why I want to explain the end at the beginning, <laughs> how to respond after the sermon. Because uh, I don't want to take, I don't want to stop uh, from what God's doing through His Word and into the place where we worship Him. Uh, so that's what we'll do. I'll just, I'll just finish uh, the sermon. Um, I've actually just thank you also, team. Um, again, it's more about forgiveness than permission. But I really felt just to keep it small, and so it's just going to be Debbie and Marie that come back. So that we're almost, almost a cappella as we sing to God this morning. Uh, and it's a bit unusual, but I just felt like this is the way we should go this morning. Normally, in our church, this is one of the things I love the most about Pastor John. He is always, he's never going to not have an invitation for you to meet Jesus. That's what we normally do every week. And it's that important that we do it every week. Uh, today... The invitation's there. If you're here and you don't know Jesus and he speaks to you this morning, just come and see us after the service. I don't actually want to break the worshipping of God and just giving him praise. It's, it's what Pastor Doug was saying. We, it's about remembering who Jesus is this morning and, and just getting into that place. So maybe you're here and maybe you don't know God. Maybe this is your first time in church. This could be the first time that you worship him. You may actually, you may do it a bit backwards too. You may worship him and then get introduced to him afterwards. <laughs> That's okay too. And the other thing, Pastor John said this last week, God will often do, the Holy Spirit will do things in praise. As we praise him, as we worship him, it's the, it's the time when the Holy Spirit really moves. You could feel yourself even physically moved um, as we worship him. Maybe it's just, you know, in your heart and connection with him. But if you're in that place, if you feel sensate, you know, like if you feel a warmth or a heat or anything like that, if God's doing something in you, we, I invite you now to really just come out, if you want to, out the front, and then we'll pray with you afterwards. If, so the invitation's here now so that we don't have to do it at the end, if that makes sense. Uh, so we won't invite anyone up. But if anybody wants to come and use this space, even if you just want to come up and kneel down, or it's a completely open and free um, invitation to do that. All right. So today is Palm Sunday. It's one week before Easter, uh, which was also one week before Passover. It's the same thing. It's the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem, riding on... And the people welcomed him then as their king. It's a really significant day. We kind of pass over it and we just go straight to Easter. But Palm Sunday is an incredibly significant day. Jesus came into Jerusalem. He was declaring himself as the Messiah. And the people were um, meeting him that way. So a little bit of background. Israel was under Roman occupation. They didn't have a king at that time. Rome was ruling, and, the, uh, and Caesar in Rome had put people uh, in charge of Israel. So the people were longing to be set free. The people in Israel, they hadn't had a king for a long time. They were longing for the Messiah, the promised Messiah, to come to set them free from oppressors. And of course, their hope, like never before, like... This guy shows up. First, there was John the Baptist. God has kind of been silent. There's been no prophets for 400 years. And then John the Baptist showed up, and he starts saying, prepare the way because he's coming. 
And so there's this incredible excitement that it's going to happen. The Messiah is coming. And then there's this miracle worker from Galilee. And he's going around and he's doing... Incre- and the miracles, the whispers at first, but they're increasing. The miracles are getting greater and greater. The Jewish leaders just want to keep the peace. They're afraid of the Romans. They have, you know, rebellious leaders popping up all the time, disturbing things, and they are afraid of Rome. They also don't want to lose their own power. And so the Jewish leaders of that time, uh, the religious leaders as well, they are afraid that Jesus is going to come and incite a rebellion. The people want it, the leaders don't. The people loved the miracles. The, um, the Pharisees and others did not. I, I still struggle with that. It's like, oh no, now he's raising dead people. <laughs> How dare he? <laughs> I don't get it. So at this point in our story, by Palm Sunday, because Jesus has been doing this for three years, he's been getting more and more famous. He's always downplayed it. People are saying, are you the Messiah? He's saying, no, 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 no. Shush, shush. The demons are going, you are the one. You're the king. And he says, don't tell anyone. Stop. So he's been keeping it a secret for three years, for his whole ministry. And now we get to this day, and he's letting it out of the bag. But for that reason, it's getting extremely dangerous for Jesus. When he comes back to Jerusalem, which is the center of Israel, it's, it's the political and the spiritual religious center of the nation when he comes back there he's really coming face to face with these religious leaders and so it's become extremely dangerous everybody knows everyone knows that a showdown is building so john 12 1 to 19 uh, reading from the new living translation six days before the passover celebration began jesus arrived in bethany the home of lazarus the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance, and that fragrance would have stayed with Jesus for the entire week, even onto the cross. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, Well, that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared about the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. And so Jesus replied, Leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You'll always have the poor among you but you will not always have me. So when all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. So it's this double whammy. Jesus is coming, and now the the guy who was raised from the dead, he's here too. Then the leading priests, they decided they had to kill Lazarus as well. For it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and they believed in Jesus. The next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and they went down the road to meet him. Hence, Palm Sunday. They shouted, praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hail to the King of Israel. Praise God. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and he rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your King is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. 
But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened, and they realized that these things had been written about him. And what they mean by these things, they mean the Bible, <laughs> the Old Testament. These things had been written a thousand years ago about him. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason that so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. And so the greater the miracles that Jesus performed, uh, it seemed like the matter the Pharisees got. <laughs> the greater the um, miracles that he was performing, they just made them angrier and angrier. That this charlatan was somehow healing people and <laughs> the blind were seeing and now he was raising the dead. How dare he? And I'm always amazed, church, at um, just how determined some people can be to refuse Jesus. I mean, we've probably all been there ourselves. But you can be in a place where you know God is speaking to you and you know it's him, and you just come up with the most incredible excuses <laughs> as to why it's not. <laughs> but they weren't denying the miracles. They weren't actually denying that these were miracles. They were just saying, we wish he would stop doing them. <laughs> we wish he would stop because the people are all going after him. And now he has finally done what they all suspected. He has proclaimed himself as the Messiah. He has proclaimed himself as the King of Israel. And so they'd had enough, and it was going to be time for Jesus to die. Luke 19, 36 to 48. Uh, New Living Translation again. As he, rode, as he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying these things, saying things. And he replied, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into chairs. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and he saw the city ahead, he began to weep. Is the microphone okay? Is it going up and is it, should I change mics, Matt? It's all good? Okay. As he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you, of all people, would understand the way to peace. But now it is too late. And peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize when God visited you. So Jesus was speaking about 70 years into their future in 70 AD, when the Romans would, in fact, come and crush uh, Jerusalem. And the Jewish people would go into exile for another 2,000 years. Then Jesus entered the temple and he began to drive out the people selling animals for sacrifices. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be a house of prayer. But you have turned it into a den of thieves. And after that, he taught daily in the temple. But the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the other leaders of the people 
began planning how to kill him. But they could think of nothing because all the people hung on every word he said. It's really hard to kill a guy who's healing the sick, uh, raising people from the dead, and is also morally perfect. For me, church, that, that phrase that we just covered, that uh, where Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem, and he says they, they didn't recognize when God visited them. To me, church, it's, it's one of the saddest <laughs> phrases in the Bible, isn't it? The reality of it. Because I know people where that's happened to them. God has visited them. I've seen it like God is calling their name. And they just don't, rec- they choose not to recognize it. They just let him go. And I think there's going to be no one with more horror, more terror, more regret on the day of judgment than those people who have, who have known that God was visiting them and they still just refuse. They, they put up their barriers against them. And so I do want to speak to anyone here today who may be in that space. I pray that today the Holy Spirit will just shatter, destroy any wall that you have put or someone else has put between you and God. One day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. So, what were the crowd actually shouting? Uh, they were shouting song lyrics. They were shouting song lyrics from Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is attributed to King David, so it's kind of seen that it's about him, but was written by him. And it's also about the Messiah, the coming uh, anointed one who will sing, send. And so they've been singing that song. So the Psalms are songs. The, the Jewish people had been singing that song for a thousand years before Jesus came. A thousand years they've been singing Psalm 118 since the time of David. On this particular day, as they sang, the song was fulfilled. On Palm Sunday, the original first Palm Sunday, as they sang the song, the song was fulfilled. And we're going to read it. But first, let's look at what the crowd was shouting, because they were calling out this part of the song. So Mark 11, 8 to 10. New Living Translation. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in highest heaven. That was the New Living Translation. The New International Version, NIV. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Same passage from the complete Jewish Bible. Many people carpeted the road with their clothing, while others spread out green branches which they had cut in the fields. Those who were ahead and those behind shouted, Please deliver us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Adonai. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. You in the highest heaven, please... Deliver us. Please deliver us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Adonai. Blessed is the coming kingdom of Father David. You in the highest heaven, please deliver us. So Hosanna means praise God. That's what it means. And it means please deliver us. It's the same thing. It it literally means please deliver us. But the way it's used 
is as a praise to God. It's also a recognition of the one who will actually save them. Uh, to me, I was trying to think of an equivalent in English, because um, that's why there's different translations, because no, neither of those three have really caught the whole thing. Well, Hosanna did, because they didn't translate it. <laughs> the, the English equivalent, I would say, is if we were trapped on a desert island. If we're stuck with, you know, our ship is sunk or whatever, and we're stuck on a desert island, and then we see a rescue ship or a rescue helicopter coming, and we start screaming, save, save, saved. Because it's what we need. <laughs> we believe it's about to happen, and we can see who's going to do it. That's the equivalent of Hosanna. We need it. We, we believe it's going to happen, and we know where the salvation is coming from. That is what Hosanna means. A recognition of our desperate need, a declaration of hope and praise, and it's a prophetic word of the coming Messiah uh, as well. So there were two other quick things in that passage. Blessed is he who comes to the name of God in the New Living Translation, the NIV. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Adonai in the Jewish... Um, so the psalm itself would have been written with the personal name of God, the um, YWYH, the personal name of God given to Moses. But the Jews were so afraid of misusing God's name, so that's, it would have been written with, with, I see that quiz on your face, Stacey. <laughs> it would have been written with YWYH. The Jews were so afraid of misusing God's name that they wouldn't say his name. And so what they also had written down was the word Lord or Adonai. And so they would have Yahweh, but then they would have Adonai, and they would say Adonai, the Lord, instead of using his name, because they were too afraid of his name. And so what happened is over time that Yahweh and Adonai became another word, Jehovah. So a mixture of those letters, and that's where we get the word Jehovah from. What I'm going to do when we do read through Psalm 118, I'm going to use Yahweh instead of the Lord. Uh, and that's because we miss a little bit of the personal nature of Yahweh. We miss a little bit of the, the, the personal connection to the only true God, and his name is Yahweh. You'll see, I hope, when we read it. And the other part is that it's saying the coming kingdom of our father David. It's very significant that they were expecting a king like David. Uh, you know, they could have said Moses or Elijah, miracle workers. But the song is about King David coming. King David's kingdom coming. David was a warrior king. David was a warrior he won battles. He destroyed enemies. He killed giants. David was a warrior king, and a king David could easily take care of a pesky Roman empire. Easily. They were expecting and wanting a warrior king. But the key for us to understand in this is that they weren't doing that because that's what they wanted. They were expecting it because that is what was written. God had declared that he will send a warrior king like David. That's who the Messiah was going to be according to God himself. It is what they wanted, but it's also what God himself has decreed. The Messiah is going to be a ruler of nations. He's going to be a warrior. He's going to be one who kills giants. He's going to be a king like that. So it's no wonder that uh, the people were so excited and the leaders were so nervous uh, because it was clear to them that the Messiah was going to come, that he was going to set them free from the oppressors, that he was going to be a warrior king, and they'd been singing about it for 1,000 years. 
Psalm 118. So they were probably actually singing the whole song. Psalm 118, New Living Translation. Give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good, and his love endures forever. Let all Israel repeat his love endures forever. Let Aaron's descendants, the priests, repeat his love endures forever. Let all who fear Yahweh repeat his love endures forever. And in my distress I prayed to Yahweh, and Yahweh answered me and set me free. Yahweh is for me, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Yes, Yahweh is for me. He will help me. I will look in triumph at those who hate me. It's better to take refuge in Yahweh than to trust in people. It's better to take refuge in Yahweh than to trust in princes. Though hostile nations surrounded me, I destroyed them all with the authority of Yahweh. Yes, they surrounded and attacked me, but I destroyed them all with the authority of Yahweh. They swarmed around me like bees. They blazed against me like a crackling fire, but I destroyed them all with the authority of Yahweh. My enemies did their best to kill me, but Yahweh rescued me. Yahweh is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. Songs of joy and victory are sung in the camp of the godly. The strong right arm of Yahweh has done glorious things. The strong right arm of Yahweh has raised, is raised in triumph. The strong right arm of Yahweh has done glorious things. I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell what Yahweh has done. So I'm going to switch back to using the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not let me die. Open for me the gates where the righteous enter, and I will go in and thank the Lord. These gates lead to the presence of the Lord, and the godly enter there. <coughs> thank you for answering my prayer and giving me victory. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Okay, that's your opportunity. Come on. Oh, you're not going to sing the song? Sing it. Go on, have a little. Go on, have a little break. Give me my voice a little break. That's right. We didn't know that Keith Green actually wrote Psalm 118. <laughs> this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And then it goes on to our, the bit we've been waiting for. Please, Lord, please save us. Hosanna. Please, Lord, please save us. Please, Lord, please give us success. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God shining upon us. Take the sacrifice and bind it with cords on the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. So that is the song they were singing, church, as Jesus walked into Jerusalem that day. As all the people were laying down their coats and, and palm branches, that's the song they were singing. So it's no wonder that they tried to get them to stop singing that song. It is a declaration that the Messiah has arrived. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout and triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So Jesus had made no secret of it. He did that intentionally. He was proclaiming himself as the Messiah. That 
was the day that the Lord had made. How exciting, church. (laughs) A thousand years you've been singing that song, and on that day, you're singing it and you're seeing it. For a thousand years, you've been singing the Messiah is coming, and on that day, and there's been a big build-up, there's been John the Baptist, there's been miracles, there's been this growing hope, and on that day, Jesus is finally going, yep, it's me. He's the one who agreed to the cult. He's the one coming in. They say, hey, you need to stop. You need to stop them. He's saying, if you stop them, the stones themselves are going to cry it out. I'm the Messiah. It's the day. It's the day the Lord has made. What excitement on that day, how crushing a few days later, how crushing for that crowd when their warrior king, without barely putting up a fight, is taken into custody by the Romans and he's exposed as the fraud that he is. Because that's not going to happen. It's not possible to do that to the warrior king, Messiah. How crushing to all those people who are just two days before ready to go with him to fight the Romans and now they see him bloody and beaten in chains. You'd probably join in as well. Crucify him. Crucify him. John 19, 1 to 22. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead tipped whip. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. And they put a purple robe on him. Hail to the King of the Jews. They mocked as they slapped him across the face. Pilate went outside again and he said to the people, I'm going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find, no, that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said, Look, here is the man. Behold the man. When they saw him, the leading priests and the temple guards began shouting, Crucify him, crucify him. Take him yourselves and crucify him, Pilate said. I find him not guilty. The Jewish replied, By our law he ought to die because he called himself the Son of God. When Pilate said this, he was more frightened than ever. He took Jesus back into the headquarters again and he asked him, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Why don't you talk to me, Pilate demanded. Don't you realize that I have the power to release you or to crucify you? Then Jesus said, you have no power over me at all unless it's given to you from above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greatest sin. Then Pilate tried to release him, but the Jewish leaders shouted, if you release this man, you're no friend of Caesar. Anyone who declares himself as a king is a rebel against Caesar. When they said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again. Then Pilate sat down on the judgment seat on the platform that is called uh, the stone pavement in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was now about noon on the day of preparation for the Passover. And Pilate said to the people, look, here is your king. Away with him, they yelled. Away with him, crucify him. What? Crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the leading priest shouted back. Then Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. He went to the place called Place of the Skull. In Hebrew, it's Golgotha. And there they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side with Jesus between them. And Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, 
Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek so that many people could read it. Then the leading priests objected and they said to Pilate, change it from the king of the Jews to he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, no, what I have written, I have written. And so it's no wonder, church, that these Pharisees were so spiteful in their treatment of Jesus on the cross because he'd just come in as a big troublemaker. He'd come with all the people singing and saying that he's this king He'd gone, he'd turned over all the um, tables in the treasury. Uh, he was making a big deal of himself, and now he's crucified on a cross. And so they're saying to him, come on, you saved others, save yourself. If you're the Messiah, how can we even do this to you? Get yourself down. You said you're the son of God, let's see what God does. So there's all that spiteful mockery uh, of Jesus on the cross. And they just couldn't see him until he died. Can I get Debbie and Marie to come back up? We're going to go into a place of worship in a second church. But I just want to throw one question out to us as we examine ourselves before God. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a place where you are absolutely 100% standing in faith with God and then sometime later you are utterly disappointed by Him? Because it happens. <laughs> it happened to the crowd. Because we don't always know God's plans. And it's, that's actually a hard place for Christians to be. Uh, I know my son Jesse was talking about a sermon that um, they'd listened to a few weeks ago and the pastor was kind of saying this. He said, you know, some people here need to forgive God. And their immediate was like, oh, you can't forgive God because God doesn't do anything wrong. That is true. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that you don't hold bitterness towards God. It's not that God did anything wrong. Jesus didn't do anything wrong. But our expectation in him can sometimes not be met. And so I think this morning is, is an opportunity to give that back to him. Is, so if anyone's in that place, uh, and that's really the only kind of challenge I felt. To, the rest is just about education. <laughs> we all know what Palm Sunday was about today, and we're about to worship um, that fact, that this was the day that God made. But that's my, one kind of, that's my one kind of Holy Spirit prompting, that if anyone's relating to that, Oh, I had so many hopes that God would do this or do that, and it didn't happen. Today, I think, is a good opportunity to just give that back. Matthew 28, 1 to 7. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and he rolled it and he sat on it and his face shone like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman, don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said he would. Come see where his body was lying, and now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there. Remember what I've told you. And what we know, church, which they didn't know at the time, is that by sacrificing himself, he was the warrior king. He, be, he was slaying giants. He was slaying the giants of sin and condemnation. He was buying our freedom by his death on the cross. He accomplished it all. 
as Pastor Doug led us through communion this morning, nothing that we can do, he accomplished everything by sacrifice. And they didn't take his life, he gave it up. But there's another truth that he is a warrior king. And when Jesus returns, he's coming back again. And he's not riding a donkey. He's riding, we have, we've been told what's going to happen. He's going to ride a war horse. He's going to lead the angel armies. He's coming back and every knee that's ever been, every voice that's ever lived, every knee will bow down, every voice will proclaim that he is Lord. For us who know him, that's going to be an amazing praise. For those who don't, a terrifying confession that they got it wrong. A terrifying. It says even those who pierced him, they're going to bow down and confess that he is Lord. So what we're going to do now, church, is just go into an offering of praise. We're going to sing Hosanna. We're going to, to come with everything we've just learned and just come to that place of crying out, thank you, Lord. Save us. Thank you for saving us. You're the Savior. And I just invite you into that place. If you've never worshipped him before, worship him now. And if you have any questions, just come and see us um, afterwards. Father God, we just commit this worship to you, Lord, and we ask you to move amongst us. Pierce our hearts, Father. Break down walls. Encourage us. Flame the coals into fire, Lord. We as a church, Lord, we surrender to you afresh today. This is the day the Lord has made. And Father, we just give ourselves to you fully afresh. Amen. Stand together if you can stand. I see the King of glory coming on the clouds with fire. Roll earth shakes, roll earth I see His love and mercy washing over all our sin. The people sing. The people sing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna.
make this your prayer. Open up our eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you and love me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I have. again and make that your prayer this morning. Heal my heart. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open eyes. Open up my eyes to the thing unseen. Show me how to love like you and love to me. Hey. 